Welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. And here, once again, is in Waynesville, North Carolina, just outside of Asheville. We are up on the mountain and the snow is going away. Hooray! Hooray! We were snowed in for a week. Or more. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> and just got out today, or yesterday for the first time. So. We were able to bring down the car off the mountain. But God is in control. Thank so we've, we've had a blessed time here so far. And we'll be here for another couple of days before we head off to Nashville, Tennessee to meet uh, for a meeting and then off to Dallas, Texas. We are continuing on in our study of the evidence of a redeemed life. Uh, this started out just basically as an encouragement for us all, for me and Alice and you, to just do what Paul says and test ourselves to see examine where ourselves. we are, examine ourselves to see where we are in our walk with the Lord. It's a, it's a good thing to do. It must be because the Word of God says to do it. It's the fruit evident in our yes. mind. And that's exactly what our determination was early on, was that if you're going to examine yourself, well, Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. So we're looking for the evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, this is our ninth yes, it part is. of this study, and I believe it will be our conclusion to this study. If you've missed any part of it, it's here on the Bible Talk website, BibleTalk.com, and you can see it all. You can go back. You can uh, ask others or tell others that it's there and available for them to see it. And I believe that's the end of my commercial. <laughs> it, 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 it will bless you if you haven't gone yeah, back well, and listened to them. It's the Word of God, and the Word of God should always, always bless, bless you. you. Yes, yeah. all right. Bless and encourage. So we're, we're going to pick up where we Sorry, we're, We've been going through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And now we are in the last of that fruit, and that is self-control. That's what it says in the New American Standard, actually in, in virtually all New English translations, including New King James, by the way. Uh, the, the King James says temperance, but we'll talk about that. But before we do, let's just take a minute and do this. Father, we just thank you that we can come together. Lord, that we can use this technology that exists to connect with one another around the globe, Lord God. Lord, that, that while it's not as good as being eyeball to eyeball, to be able to greet one another with a holy kiss, at least, Lord God, we can connect and we can share your word. And we're praying, Lord, that your word would go into all the world because that's what we know has to happen. So, Lord, help us to be guided by your word. Help us to be encouraged by your word to do what your word says, to make sure that we are indeed walking in the fullness of new life according to your word. So we thank you for this time. We just thank you for your Holy Spirit sent to lead us into all truth. Above all, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh who dwelt among us and did for us what we could never do for ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray that. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. amen. All right, so as I said... We're looking at self-control. Um, temperance is kind of an older word. And I think in... Old English. Yeah, old English. And you don't, it's not a word you hear very much anymore. And it's, it typically has to do with... I mean, there was a temperance movement in the United States a century ago about you know, trying to get people to stop drinking. Right. Self-control is something a little beyond that, a little different, okay, as, as we understand it. And that's why, as I said, I think every, every English translation today uses that term self-control. I want to start with this scripture, okay? okay? From John 15, verse 4. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. John 15, 4, as I say. Now, do you know what a paradox is? I think you do. Paradox. Paradox. A paradox is defined as a seemingly self-contradictory statement. And it comes from the Greek word paradoxos. And that means exi opposed to existing beliefs. In other words, it can't, can't really be this way. And in the scriptures, there's a lot of examples of paradoxes. So let me just give you a couple, all right? Just to, so you get, make sure we understand we're on the same page here. 
Paul wrote, and he said, Therefore I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's 2 Corinthians 12.10. That's a paradox. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Right? It's not an oxymoron. An oxymoron is something different. That's okay. A paradox is a truth that seems to be contradictory, but it's not. Because like Jesus said when he was speaking to Martha, right? when he went to uh, the, the, the tomb of Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Okay? Now, the reason I'm saying that, because in the opening verse that I just read, right, I quoted Jesus saying a branch only bears fruit because it's attached to the vine. And then saying that we cannot bear fruit unless we abide in him. It is not the branch that's responsible for the fruit, but the vine. Jesus continued on to say in the next verse, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now think about that. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So the self that appears in self-control as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, in, like I said, in almost all translations, seems to be somewhat paradoxical. Right? Because it's not how, it can't, how can it be self if Jesus you says, you can't do anything unless it's me kind of doing it, right? Unless you're abiding in me. Apart from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there can be no self-control that enables us to live the new lifestyle that bears the evidence of our new life. Is the self-control dealing only with the flesh? No. Okay. The answer to that question is no. Okay. The self-control that this is talking about, and I'm saying it's a, a bit of an, uh, a paradox, mm -hmm. it has to do with everything, like the Word of God. You know, Peter says it, it, it has everything to do with life and godliness. Mm -hmm. This self-control has everything to do with life and godliness. It's, it's everything. You can't separate your spiritual life from the life that you're living day to day. And that's one of the problems that I've seen in the church. We tend to do that. You know, that we live differently on, quote unquote, on Sunday or when we're in that church building than what we do when we're at work on Monday. You can't do that. We're supposed to live an integrated life. You know, the highest command was in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, you know, he is the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. In the same way, we're supposed to be one. We're not supposed to have split personalities. We're not supposed to be, is that psychotic? Um, when when you, you, know, you live one way, you're one person on Sunday and you're another person on Monday at work, you can't do that. That's being disobedient to the, to the whole concept of God's work in us. And that goes back to the fact that we are spirits. We are spirits. And not flesh. We are, we are what we are is a spirit, born yes. of spirit, born yes. of the Father. Yes dwelling inside this flesh. The flesh is not me. No. The, the flesh is no more me than this shirt that I'm wearing is me. It's kind of a, a, something that's wrapped around me, right? But the same way that God is spirit, so now am I, having been born again from above by the Father, right? All right. So it, it, it's that self-control that comes from the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ that enables us to live the new lifestyle, like I said. Think about what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4 when he said, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. So, you know, we have to have this. We've got to put off the old man and put on the new, right? In other words, this self-control is not something that you can do yourself. That's, that's where it's a paradox. 
the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, but it's not something that you can do it's yourself. The Holy Spirit in us. But it has to be your choice. Yes. Something that you choose. Yeah. Well, that's overcoming the flesh. That's the Spirit taking over the flesh, and not the flesh overcoming the Spirit. It's our choice coupled with God's work. Mm -hmm. All right? Think about the words of that, that wonderful hymn, I Surrender All. Right? You know, I Surrender All. Yes. It was all. written by they Justin Van De Venter. Yeah. And there's an underlying confidence in the words of Paul that he said when he said, when I am weak, I am strong. Right. There's a confidence in God there, right? An assurance of the truth that when I surrender all, I gain all. Right. Again, as Paul wrote, think about what he wrote to the Philippians here. Philippians chapter 3, he said, well, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Amen. You surrender all to gain all. Because if you've got all, Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the world it's giving you and receive. lose your soul? But, it, but it's here, you know, by giving all that way, then you can receive all. It's more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus Absolutely. said. Absolutely. All right? So, self-control is discipline. Yes, most definitely. It's true discipline. Mm -hmm. And true discipline is to choose to be discipled by the Master, Jesus. Self-control, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is to surrender all control. There you go. That's why it's a paradox. <laughs> Self-control is to surrender all control. Give and, it over. You know, in our last chapter, the, the last one we did last week, Gentleness. it said, in, you know, I started by saying, you know, quoting Jesus when Jesus said, learn from me. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yes. Okay. So let's learn. Jesus said, learn from me. Think about Jesus saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus surrendered control mm, to the right. Father. That's self-control, is that ability to surrender control. Mm. Remember that Jesus said, so, and you don't hear this preached a lot, I don't think, but so then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Luke 14, 33. And it says that in, in Matthew and Mark, right? Mm -hmm. You can't be a disciple of Jesus unless you give up all your possessions. Well, when I say that, and this is one of the reasons it's not preached, because I think most people think, okay, I've got to give up my car, I've got to give up my house, I've got to give up my bank account. No, you know what? The possession... You say give them away. Uh, no, no, but, but the, the possession that we as humans, grasp most tightly mm -hmm. is our own will. Mm. That's very true. It, it is very true. Yeah. We don't want to surrender control of our own lives. That's what we possess and hold on to, the, cling to the, the most so dear, true. right? Yeah. And yet Jesus said, you can't, you can't be his disciple unless you give up everything. Give up that will. And it starts with giving up your own will. It starts with giving up control of your life, surrendering the control of your life. God, our Father, sent His Son, Jesus, to accomplish all that was needed to provide new and eternal life to whoever would believe and receive it, mm -hmm. right? It's available to everyone. Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished. He did it all. That said, the account of Jesus and His friend Lazarus in John chapter 11, becomes very revealing. And I, I, if you don't know this story, please go spend some time reading all of John chapter 11, but you probably have heard the, the, the account. Jesus hears that his friend Lazarus is sick, so he immediately waits. Remember, patience is one of the things that we've studied. You know, it says that there's, there is... And appoint a time for every event. God is the one who appoints and God is the one who decides because God is in control. Okay? So hearing his friend Lazarus was sick, 
he waits, and then he goes to Bethany, where Lazarus now, four days dead, has been buried in a tomb, right? Outside the tomb, he tells the people there to roll the stone aside that, that blocks the tomb. And then he gives thanks to the Father before a miracle is done. And then it says, when he had said these things, praying to the Father and telling them to roll the stone away, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. John eleven forty three, 43, right? Now, Jesus did not tell a dead man to come forth. No. He gave that command to a man who had just been called by name into new life. All right? I just, this past weekend, or the weekend before, I heard a pastor talking about this, as a matter of fact. He mentioned it. And he said that had not Jesus called Lazarus by name, all of the dead would have come forth. Well, that's kind of a popular concept, but I, one I don't believe to be true at all. And the reason I don't believe it's true, and I, you know, while it sounds nice, if Jesus had not called Lazarus by name, it's probable that nobody would have come forth. Exactly. Because you want to know something? I believe that nothing happens until people hear Jesus speak to them personally. That includes you and me, right? It has to come alive. It has to be, you have to be knowing that, that when you hear the word of God, that it's speaking to you. Otherwise, nothing happens. Nothing will happen. That's right. I mean, millions of Christians in this country, I know, went to church this, this past Sunday, and they'll go in and they'll hear a sermon, they walk out, they want to know something, nothing's changed. Nothing changed, yeah, because they didn't hear it. But anybody sitting in a pew that heard a word and heard the Lord speak to them, it's going to change them. Absolutely. All right? It has to start that way. I believe that nothing happens until people hear Jesus speak to them personally. In Isaiah 43, as well as other passages, right, it, it, they attest to the fact that God's work was started with him calling someone like me by name. He called me by name. He called you by name if you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. So when Jesus called out Lazarus' name, he came to life there in that tomb. New life by the power of the word, right? But he was still sitting in the darkness of the tomb. That's right. Then, by the way, if you, if you look at this, I, I don't want to make too fine a point of this, but every, um, every English version of the Bible that I know of, and I'm, I'm talking about dozens of them, if you look at the punctuation, it says, Lazarus, comma, come forth, period. Well, let me tell you, first of all, in the time that this was written in Greek, they didn't use punctuation. There was no punctuation. And I, I disagree with all of those versions because I believe a more accurate translation would be G Lazarus, period, come forth, exclamation point. <laughs> well, I believe that, right? But it's two separate things. When Jesus cried out, and he, he cried out, it says with a loud voice, loud enough to penetrate the darkness of that tomb, loud enough to penetrate death. Lazarus heard that word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And by that faith, he was raised into new life. But then he heard a command. Now alive, he heard a command of God. Come forth. He had to choose to obey that command. Otherwise, he'd be alive, still sitting in the tomb. And you want to know something? And I promise you I don't say this in condemnation or judgment. But if we're talking about the evidence of a new life, I know a lot of Christians, and it seems like this, they're, they're alive, but still sitting in the tomb, sitting in the darkness. Remember, Lazarus was confronted with a choice. He could walk out of darkness into the Lord's marvelous light. Isn't that what Peter says? First Peter 2, 9? That we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light in order to proclaim his excellencies. You know... Faith comes by hearing, but then comes a choice of obedience. And interestingly enough, the word to hear and the word to obey in Hebrew is the same word, Shema. All right? It says in Deuteronomy 28 that the blessings of God come from obedience. Those who hear his voice and then obey his voice, he will bless in the city, in the country, coming in, going out. All right? When we talk about faith, Faith is, what can you do? With anything done not in faith is sin. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But in that great faith chapter, Hebrews 11, it says of, of the one that Paul says is our, in the natural, kind of our father in the faith of Abraham, it says by faith, Abraham obeyed. Well, I'm going to tell you, by faith, Lazarus obeyed and came out of that tomb. Like self-control. Giving up control is your choice. Yes. There are things that God will not force you to do here in this life on this planet. It's your choice. From, from Adam in the garden, he gave him a choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's always a command. God is a God of free choice. Yes. Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 30, he says, I set before you life and death, the blessings and the curse. I set before you life and death. Choose life. He gives us that choice. Adam had a choice. Mm -hmm. He made the wrong decision. Yes. Life is about the choices we make. New life is about the choices we make. Giving up control of your life and surrendering that control to the Lord God Almighty who loves you enough to send Jesus into this world is the right choice to make. I'm telling you that now. Amen. <clears throat> but it is, like I said, I think of all of the possessions we have, the one that we cling to the most is our own control, our own will. It says in Proverbs 3, don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. He'll deliver you. Okay. Okay. When Lazarus came out of that tomb, and I'm not going to go too far with this because I, I just love this whole subject, but he came walking out of that tomb, kind of waddling out of the tomb because he was still bound in the grave clothes. He was wrapped in grave clothes. So the first thing when he comes out is Jesus says to the people there, maybe the church, unbind him. You see, because when we walk into new life that Jesus so dearly purchased for us with his shed blood upon that cross, we come into new life like Lazarus did, wrapped in the clothes of death. We still have the old habits. We still have the old traditions. We still have the old ways of thinking. And that's why the word of God, Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, now, 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 he's speaking to believers. Don't be conformed to this world the way it used to be in your life, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to change those old, get rid of those old habits. You have to get rid of those old traditions. You have to get rid of that old self and put on the new self. Didn't you hear me read that? Yes. Put on the new self. Get out of those grave clothes and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and start walking in the newness of life. And then you will see the evidence of that new life in your life. Hallelujah. Because Jesus surrendered his will. And that's what we're putting on Absolutely. Jesus. Who's already surrendered his will. Absolutely. We but we have to choose to, do that. to obey. Mm -hmm. Do you think God will force you to obey? No. No, I'll tell you there may be horrible consequences from there disobedience. Will there will be horrible. I, I repent. There will be. I'm, I never should have said may. No, there will be. I, you know, I, I quoted a minute ago and I said, you know, if you go and it's worth your while to spend time, this may, consider this your homework assignment for the week. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Because those first 14 verses in that chapter 28 talk of the wonderful blessings of God and how dearly we need those blessings in this day and age, in this time. That if you hear his voice and obey it, how God will bless you. But from verse 15 on, read that. Because it says if you hear his voice and choose to disobey, the all of these curses will come upon you. Ooh. There is a consequence to disobedience. Absolutely. So you have to choose to obey. Okay? Hear and obey. There are things that you have to do. You know, I said Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished. Well, I, I just mentioned one. We, it, it doesn't say, okay, I'll transform your mind. We, we have the mind of Christ. But it says, you now, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. When you get thoughts, you're going to get thoughts just like you used to get, the old worldly thoughts. You have to take them captive to the obedience of Christ. And in order to do that, you've got to know the teaching of Jesus Christ. You've got to know the Satan word. Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he's going to be bothering you. <laughs> Absolutely, he's going to be bothering you. I mean, that's, listen, that's what he does. That's, that's what Satan means. He's the adversary. 
All right? Our, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, you know, the Word of God says. It is against those powers and principalities. And, you know, if you look at a lion in the wild, they always go after the weakness. That's right. Right? Though, Satan will go after the weakness in your life. The thing is, our God is a refuge. Our God is a stronghold. He's a tower. Yes, he is a tower. He's a shield. You know, a lot of people think, um, you know, the Star of David, mm -hmm. the symbol of Israel. Yeah. It is not the Star of David. That's what we've come to commonly call it. But the fact of the, of the matter is, it is called in Hebrew the Mogan, da, da, Mogan David. David, which means the shield of David. And that's that Jewish star, that shield of David, must be the first symbol I know of, of Jesus Christ. Because David said, the Lord is my shield. That's right. So when you see somebody wearing that, uh, sh that Jewish star, say hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That we're in a symbol of Jesus Christ, right. the Almighty, my, my refuge and my strength. So you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Just another example. You know, it says in James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves. Now, if you, don't hum if you don't choose to humble yourself, you may wind up humiliating. That's a fact. God does not want you humiliated. He wants you humble so that he might exalt you. His desire is to lift you up, for the calling of God is an upward calling. But it requires that we choose to humble ourselves. And we're supposed to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Well, you know what? It is the presence of the Lord that will humble you. That's right. That's a, you know, I think last year or the year before, Alice and I were over in North Wales. And we were at a conference. And I, I may have shared this with some of you, that uh, during the midst of this, it's a, not a large group, a small group. And I don't recall what was being discussed, but it was like I had a vision. Mm -hmm. And I saw a figure, I never saw his face, but up on a, on a hill. And I, I knew that it was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I saw people approaching him. Mm -hmm. But before they would get to him on this hillside, going up this hill, they would fall on their faces. And I, I just was fascinated by this. It was like watching a television screen or a movie screen, and it was that vivid. And I could see these people coming from all directions. And some would fall far away, and some would get close and fall down. But, but everybody was coming and falling down on their faces. And I didn't understand it. And I said, Lord, you know, what is this? And he, I, the Lord said to, spoke to my heart and said, Who then is the humble? The ones getting close to me or the ones farther? And you know, it was the ones who were farther because they were overwhelmed by the awesomeness, mm -hmm. the glory of God before the others were. Mm -hmm. When we come into the presence of God, we should be overwhelmed by his awesome glory. You know what worship is? Worship is to fall on your face before God. It's not jump up and down and bang a guitar or a keyboard and sing a song. It is to be overwhelmed by the awesome glory of God. And then you present yourself a living and holy sacrifice down on your face before God. And it's those who get so close to him that are, can, and can even speak to him and say, Lord, look what I did. Yeah, well, that's, that's the danger, yes. That's I mean, the, the people that don't have that humility, the people that have pride will come, they'll, get close, they'll come right up to him that's right. and say, Lord, Lord, look what I did. Uh, look what I did. And you, they'll say, I did in your name. I cast out demons. I did miracles. And he'll say to them, depart from me, you evil ones. I Ooh. never knew you. You know, we've we spent a lot of time. We've spent nine weeks now talking about the evidence of a redeemed life. There are all the things that we've talked about are those things that give evidence. But I don't think there's anything that gives the evidence greater than a humble heart. Pride is the gateway to all sin. The arrogance of pride says you don't know the glory of God. So, think about that. 
And do remember this. Self-control is choosing to give up control. That's where victory and triumph is. Like Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. This same Paul, who, who went through incredible trials and tribulations, said he walked always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Because that's the desire of God. But remember what I read in the beginning. Jesus saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. He gives us the power to surrender control and to live as bond servants of the Most High God. Being a bond servant is a choice. Because you know what? It says he came to set the captives free. Who the Son has set free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He says, I don't call you slaves, I call you friends. But a bondservant is somebody who goes back and says, I want to serve you. Yes. If you want to see victory in your life, go to the Lord and say, I want to serve you. It says, that's where victory lies. That's where triumph lies in a surrendered life. That's self-control. It's not you being able to say, well, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. It's you being able to say, I want to live like Jesus. Surrender. Right, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion, okay? Okay. And I want to start that again with a verse. I, I, you know, this is a Bible study. If you came here for my opinion, I, I pray you're disappointed. If you came here to hear the Word of God, I hope that you are encouraged. It says in Ecclesiastes 7.8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Well, we're at the end. Hallelujah. Here then is the end of the matter. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The end of the matter is we look, we're, we're restored to that place where we are truly in the image of God once again looking just like Jesus. And that is the evidence of a redeemed life. Because the evidence of a redeemed life, ultimately, is to look like Jesus. That starts now, if we can say like the Apostle Paul did, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20. That's the evidence of a redeemed life, looking like Jesus Christ. We have to be able, if we're, going to, if we're going to examine ourselves and look for that evidence of a redeemed life, we have to be able to see, we have to be able to see Christ in us. Just as the Father does. Yes. And he does. And the world should not see us as best as good Christians, but they should be able to see the love of God and the work of Christ in us, redeemed and sanctified sinners. Because it's not condemnation to them, it's encouragement to them to new life. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, he came into the world to save. So, you know, the reason that we're seeking to be Christ-like and to, have, to bring the presence of Christ is because God desires that none should perish. That's, that's his desire, right? When we look at our own selves, we have to look to ourselves different than we did before. New eyes. Well, you, I mean, if I look at myself, I should be different than I was last week. I should be different. Most assuredly, I need to be different than I was before I was saved. That's right. And I want to tell you, and I don't say this boastfully because it is the work of Christ, I am, a, I am, I'm not the same guy just cleaned up. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, hallelujah. I am different than I was. But even having said that, I need to be different tomorrow than I am today. Because God's promise to me is that he will transform me and bring me from glory to glory. The calling of God is an upward calling. It is constantly going on in my life. For it is God, Paul says, who is at work in you, both to work and to will for his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. It's God working. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's, he's constantly molding and shaping, perfecting us, bringing us up to that place. 
to the world, we should look different from them. And they should be able to say, there's something about you. They should, they should absolutely see something different right. in they us. They won't know what it is. Well, then hopefully they'll ask. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. But they should yeah. see something different. They have to see something different. Otherwise, we need to really examine and see you know, what's going on that they don't see a difference in me. Think about this. Again, I'll go back to Paul writing in 2 Corinthians. He said, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? We should not walk like them. We should not talk like them. We don't love like them. We should walk, talk, and love like Jesus Christ. For you were formerly darkness. Me, I was formerly darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5.8 That's been the purpose of this particular study. To help us to walk as children of the light. To be different. To walk different. To talk different. To live and love different than the world does. And I know we mentioned this in one of the, one of the sessions we did. You know, we shouldn't have to go out and struggle to evangelize. People should see what we have that they don't have. That we have joy when they can't begin to have joy. That we have peace when they are so troubled. That's right. That we have gentleness when all they want to do is strike out. They should see this fruit of the Holy Spirit. Not our fruit, but His fruit in us. And they should be drawn to that and say, What is that? Where do you get it? Where can I get it? Right. Like the jailer said to Paul, What must I do to be saved? God wants to use you. God wants to use me to be that true presence of him in this dark, dying world. Amen. Examine yourself and see if you are bearing that evidence of God's redemption in you. And if you're not, there's an answer. Repent. Change your mind. And say, here I am, Lord. Have your own way. I surrender all. So, Father, we thank you that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the work of your word in us, give us the ability, give us the power to surrender to you, that you might have your way and work your will in our lives, that we would be lifted up to that place where we do indeed look just like your son Jesus Christ, where we are that bride without spot or wrinkle, where we are those ambassadors of your kingdom, where we are that light to the world that is so dark out there, where we are that salt that brings flavor to the world. Help us, Lord God, by the power of your spirit to be faithful witnesses to your work in us. We just praise you and thank you, Lord, that just as your word says, you still choose the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. You didn't pick us because of our goodness, because we didn't have any. You didn't pick us to do things because of who we are, but because of who you are. Lord, we just rejoice in you, that you are the potter and we are the clay. In Jesus' precious, precious name, amen and amen. Well, that is the conclusion of this particular study. Not quite sure what we're going to do next time, but we're going to do something because we're going to continue to work while it's still day. We're going to keep on going. Amen. So it's been a blessing for us to have this time and fellowship with you and time in the Word. Uh, but before we go, I know, as always, Alice wants to tell you... A fact. A true fact. Absolutely indisputable. Indisputable. Undisputable. Whatever. Disputable. Without question. <laughs> Without question. Jesus loves you. A lot. So until next time... God bless you and goodbye.